Hello, everyone, and depending on where you are, I wish you all a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. And I'd like to thank you for joining us today uh, for our Cadeth Lecture Series. I'm speaking to you today from our Cadeth office in Toronto, which is on the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today's speaker, Dr. Dalla, is at our offices in Ottawa, and uh, he is on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. The Cadeth Lecture Series gives people an opportunity to hear directly from prominent scholars and opinion leaders about pressing issues facing health care uh, and health technology assessment. Uh, it's great that so many people are taking advantage of our Cadeth Lectures, and in particular for today's opportunity, we have over 600 people registered for this talk, and they're coming from all across Canada, as well as the United States, from England, from Ireland, from Scotland, and many other parts of the world. Today's topic is quality improvement in healthcare, and in particular, the contribution that health technology assessment makes to quality improvement, and how much these two approaches can accomplish when they're used together. And uh, you'll realize that Dr. Dalla is a, is a true expert in this area. The talk will take about 40 minutes, and we'll then open it up to questions uh, for those of you who are attending in person, and uh, as well for our online audience. For those of you participating online, you can ask your questions, type them in at any time through the live stream player. And the in-person participants, just a reminder, I think there's about 75 of you. Um, if you do have questions, make sure you turn on your microphone so that you can, uh, uh, people online can hear your question as well. Um, also want to remind everyone that uh, this is a social media friendly event and Dr. Dalla is very um, engaged with things like Twitter. So you're encouraged to tweet and follow tweets using the hashtag um, Cadeth Talks. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's lecturer. Dr. Irfan Dalla is the Vice President, Evidence Development and Standards at Health Quality Ontario, the province's advisor on health care quality. He's also a general internist who cares for inpatients and teaches medical students and residents at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. And he's an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto with a cross appointment to the Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation. At Health Quality Ontario, Irfan oversees one of the largest HTA units in Canada, a great partner to CADF, uh, where he's been instrumental in reinvigorating uh, Ontario's approach to HTA. Earlier this year, I was proud to recognize Irfan when he received the Dr. Morris McGregor Award presented annually by Cadeth to an individual in the earlier stages of their career who demonstrated leadership capability in health technology assessment. Irfan, I'm, I'm sorry that I couldn't be with you in person, but rest assured that I'll be listening intently online and I might even have a few questions to pose myself. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Irfan Dalla. Uh, thanks, Brian, for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. Uh, we too really value the partnership with Cadeth and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Uh, thanks everyone for joining, whether you're in person or online. Uh, obviously those uh, online can, can tweet or look at links or whatever while you're speaking, but I would encourage folks in the room, it doesn't bother me at all, so if you want to look up an article or something while I'm uh, speaking, please feel free. I um, also want to say thanks to Peter and Stephanie and Shannon and the Cadiz team. It's been really uh, a totally wrinkle-free uh, experience and just want to say thanks. It's been great. Um, I'm going to start with a story about James Lind, and I suspect many people in the room online have heard of James Lind, a uh, Scottish physician born in 1716, a long time ago. We can pretty much guarantee he never uttered the phrase health technology assessment uh, or the phrase quality improvement. So you might be wondering why start with him. I think, I think his story can be used to illustrate the main message of my talk today, which is that health technology assessment and quality improvement 
can can go together and hand in hand uh, if we if we use these two techniques hand in hand we can improve healthcare more so let's let's review Lynn's story Lind uh, joined the British Navy uh, first as a surgeon's mate and then he became a surgeon and he eventually became the world's uh, foremost expert in a disease uh, called scurvy most of you probably know this. Scurvy is like super, super rare in Canada in 2017. Uh, I've, I've seen one case in my career. I suspect many physicians have seen none. You know, a few in Canada might have seen a half dozen or something like that, but, but very, very rare. Um, you know, might have missed some, but hopefully not. Um, but in the, you know, in the 18th century, in the British Navy, scurvy was very common. In fact, one uh, writer at the time uh, claimed that a million uh, British uh, naval uh, staff or officers had died of scurvy. Uh, a critic said that if that were true, that would mean that everybody in the Navy had died twice. So maybe not a million, but certainly thousands and thousands of deaths due to scurvy. And... Um, Lind wrote a textbook about scurvy. It was 450 pages long. And four pages in that book were devoted to probably what has made Lind uh, most famous, which is this controlled clinical trial he did of the treatment of scurvy. Mo many people probably know about this. But just to recap, he, he took uh, 12 sailors, all of whom had scurvy. And he assigned two of them to treatment with vinegar, two of them to treatment with cider, two of them to treatment with uh, sulfuric acid, two to seawater, saline control, uh, two to lemons and oranges, and two to some sort of goop uh, that as best I can tell was made up of garlic, mustard seed, and dried radish. So, you know, we know which treatment Gwyneth Paltrow would have been rooting for. <laughs> But, but, you know, you, you, you all know more than, than poor Gwyneth. And as you can probably guess, as, or as you know, the two individuals who, who got the lemons and oranges got better. They very quickly got up, started walking around again, had energy, and the others uh, did not. So, controlled trial complete, results published in textbook, scurvy eliminated, right? That's, you know, not what happened. If it was, you know, I wouldn't be telling the story today. Uh, and, and it appears Lind probably didn't even understand the results of his trial himself. He wrote this 450-page textbook on scurvy. The trial is just four pages in it. He, he actually never in that textbook makes a clear recommendation about what surgeons in the British Navy should do to treat scurvy. Uh, there's no quality improvement plan, no implementation strategy. Uh, 20 years later, he wrote a follow-up textbook. And in it, and I'll quote, he wrote, Many diseases have been well known and accurately described, like scurvy, for more than a thousand years, yet for which of them do we have an infallible remedy? What medicine can counteract the continued influence of improper diet, clean air, and confinement, the last of which in particular I now judge to be the principal cause of the great obstinacy and frequent mortality of the scurvy? So 20 years later, you know, we remember Lind for this trial he did, lemons and oranges, well-controlled, way ahead of his time. But 20 years later, he was still saying that confinement was the principal cause of scurvy. Um, you know, so, so he did his health technology assessment. He published his results, and actually nothing changed. This is a, another Scottish physician. I, I suspect fewer people in the room have heard of him uh, than James Lind. Uh, name was Gilbert Blaine. He was born about 30 years after James Lind, also worked in the Scottish Navy, and he, he knew of Lind's work. Um, and he actually made the correct conclusion, and, and he instituted a very simple quality improvement intervention. Or, or actually, he didn't institute it himself, but he catalyzed it. The, the story goes that a friend of the Blaine's in the British Navy was leading a fleet of ships that was going to leave England and go to uh, what was then called Madras, now Chennai, in India. And Blaine said, you know, uh, lots of your sailors are going to get scurvy. Why don't you give them all lemon juice? And this fleet of 19 ships left England, uh, or fleet of ships, I don't know how many, 19 weeks later, uh, landed in Madras. Not a single sailor had scurvy. 
Uh, Blaine heard about the success of this. He convinced his uh, superiors to, to institute a policy, a kind of quality improvement intervention, that, uh, that all ships in the British Navy should be stocked with lemon juice and that sailors should get lemon juice in their di diet uh, every day. And his superiors weren't totally sure, so they said, well, we'll do this, but it's kind of expensive, so uh, why don't we keep track of the data from each ship to see if this is working? And, and of course, you know that it worked. And so just a couple of years later, that scurvy was wiped out. So it went from you know maybe a million or hundreds of thousands of people dying to, to literally virtually zero in, in a few years. So, so just to recap, you know, James Lind performed this controlled clinical trial in 1747. He published a textbook, I think, in 1753. Nothing happened for 40 years. A different physician convinces the Navy to institute a quality improvement intervention. And then four years later, no scurvy in the Navy. So health technology assessment, quality improvement, together the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Here, here's a definition of health technology assessment. Uh, I'll read it out. Uh, HTA is a multidis multidisciplinary activity that systematically examines technical performance, safety, clinical efficacy, and effectiveness, cost, cost effectiveness, organizational impact, social consequences, as well as legal and ethical consequences of the application of a health technology. This uh, definition comes from David Banta. Uh, it's a good definition. There are other definitions, of course. Banta led the U.S. Um, congressional, he led the health program of the U.S. Congressional Office of Technology Assessment in the late 70s. He was the inaugural winner of HTAI's Distinguished Career Award, so, you know, a leading figure in the evolution of, of health technology assessment. And, and it, it implies a goal. And I would, might state the goal simply as this, which is to, one of the goals of HTA is to do the right thing, with apologies to Spike Lee. Um, but I want to point out a few things about Banta's definition. So first of all, the word care doesn't appear anywhere in the, in the definition. Uh, the word patient um, doesn't appear anywhere in the definition. You know, the, the reason for doing HTA is implied to, to be sure, but it's not actually explicit. And, and if I'm being totally honest, I suspect some of you in the room feel this way as well, this feels like an awfully academic definition. Right? I see some nodding in the room. Um, and HTA does a lot of things really well. I'm obviously speaking to an HTA audience. I work at an organization where HTA is a big part of what we do, and so I'm not going to cover really what HTA does well here. But the definition does, in, in my view, also point to a few areas where uh, HTA maybe struggles a little. So, so first is timeliness. You know, what if decision makers, whether they're clinicians or people who organize healthcare or pay for healthcare, what if the people making the decision need the answer today and HTA, as defined here, won't give an answer for six months or a year? Second is uh, the whole issue of patient-centeredness or, or putting patients first in what we do. And, you know, for, for those of us who are, are privileged to care for patients, HTA can often feel a little bit removed from the sort of, you know, messy complexity of individual people's lives. HTA is, I think, really good at giving us answers for populations, but the questions we often need answers for are those that are asked by individuals, individual patients in particular. And third is implementation. You know, historically, HTA has often stopped here after the examination, or maybe the examination leads to a recommendation and then we stop. And so personally, you know, I've been really pleased to see the leadership role that Cadith has been taking in terms of moving HTA from just uh, assessment, examination, recommendation through to implementation. Uh, I think that's a really nice step forward for CADIS, a nice step forward for the, the health technology assessment community more broadly. And we think about this a lot at Health Quality Ontario as well, and I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. Here on the other hand is a, is a definition of quality improvement. Um, and I'll read it too. The, the term quality improvement refers to the systematic use of methods and tools to try to continuously improve uh, quality of care and outcomes for patients. 
There are a range of different methods and tools. It's the process of having a systematic approach to quality improvement and applying this consistently that's important. And again, there are lots of definitions. This one is from the King's Fund, a, a think tank in the UK. And, and again, the, the, you know, the definitions are all pretty similar, and this one can, can serve our purposes today, I think, well enough. Uh, I, I personally like the fact that this definition includes words like quality, care, patient, and arguably in comparison to the definition of HTA, the goal here is more explicit, and that's to improve the quality of care and outcomes for patients. And so we might simply state the goal as, as follows, which is do things right. <clears throat> But I would say that this definition also have problems. Uh, first of all, the word evidence doesn't appear. Right? So the word evidence is behind me about 50 times, part of your uh, tagline at CADIS, and, and personally I think appropriately so, but actually the word evidence doesn't appear in, in this definition of quality improvement. And the related word, or our related word in the health technology assessment field uh, is cost, and that word doesn't appear either. And, and sometimes it can feel that quality improvement initiatives are done uh, without a, a lot of regard to cost. So if you, if you take the two goals I've just proposed, goal of HTA doing the right thing, goal of quality improvement doing things right, and you put them together, you get doing the right things right, which is a, a sort of a simple way, simple way to think about HTA and QI together. I, I certainly did not come up with this myself. I definitely don't want to take credit for it. If you're tweeting, the, the person who I think probably deserves the most credit for it is Paul Glashow, who wrote about this in a paper, um, I think six, seven years ago in BMJ Quality and Safety. I've seen this in construction in a World Health Organization document as long as about 15 or 16 years ago as well. But this paper is really clear and it's, it's also shorter than the WHO report. So you know, if you're looking for something to, to think about how these two fields come together from a disciplinary perspective, I would recommend this paper. Uh, and it, it just, so you know, in this paper, they describe the different philosophical underpinnings of EBM and QI. And, and they define EBM, evidence-based medicine, as an approach to medical practice intended to optimize decision-making by emphasizing the use of evidence from well-designed and well-conducted research. So, you know, somebody like James Lynn does a trial. You know, we, we might say now in 2017, we would do that trial a little bit differently. We might randomize, we might blind, we might have a larger sample size. We know a little bit more about running trials than James Lynn did, but roughly speaking, same sort of thing. And the, the main thrust of evidence-based uh, medicine, or maybe the preferred term now, evidence-based healthcare, has been to move healthcare away from the world of anecdote or opinion or history. You know, I do it this way today because I did it this way yesterday, or I do it this way because it seems like it should work, or it'll work in a, you know, it worked in a rat, or I do it this way because this is the way, you know, the Krebs cycle worked. EBM rejects all that, right? And EBM says, I do it this way because consistent with my patients' values and preferences, I also know that there's this research from elsewhere that I can generalize and bring to bear on the problem I have uh, at hand. The, the foundation of quality improvement, on the other hand, is, is arguably very different. Um, you know, most people would say that the quality improvement techniques we use today largely have been borrowed from industry. And you know, particularly folks like uh, Deming and Schuert. And if the goal is to produce cars on an assembly line that are all the same and free of defects, which is not necessarily the same as the goal in healthcare, but let's just say for a moment that is the goal, you have to do a few things. First of all, you have to understand the system that produces the cars. Um, secondly, you have to understand the people who are making the cars and what motivates them, uh, what incentives they respond to. You have to understand why there's variation in the system. So if there is an error rate uh, in the cars going down the assembly line, wh why is that happening? And after you understand those things or you know, consonant with the understanding, you can start to test changes in the system. So, so one way that I find useful in my own mind to think about evidence-based medicine, and I, I'm sort of using health technology assessment a little bit synonymously with evidence-based medicine here, and, and quality improvement, is that HTA and evidence-based healthcare 
are often a little bit externally driven. So evidence from elsewhere comes in and is brought to bear on the patient uh, and, and the clinician working together, whereas quality improvement is a little bit more internally driven. You look at evidence from within the system, from endogenous evidence, so to speak, and to use that to improve quality and, and potentially, and importantly, reduce cost. It's a bit of an oversimplification, but I think it, it's useful in thinking about how these two techniques uh, work together. And since I'm giving this talk to an audience that's maybe a little bit more skewed towards health technology assessment than quality improvement, I thought I'd take a couple of minutes to go through a paper that describes a quality improvement initiative. Uh, one of my favorites, actually from Scotland. I didn't know there were going to be folks from Scotland online, so hopefully I'm getting the facts right. But if I'm not, please uh, you know, tweet or send me an email to say what, what I've gotten wrong. Uh, also published in BMJ Quality and Safety. I don't have the citation on the slide, but hopefully with the title you can, you can get it. And, and so basically, as, as I understand this paper, um, you know, a group of clinicians uh, basically who work in a hospital, uh, they call it an acute admissions unit. We might call it a general internal medicine unit in Canada. I'm a general internist. That's one of the reasons I find this paper particularly interesting. And basically, this group of clinicians got together and they decided they wanted to reduce the number of code blues on their ward. And so for um, folks who don't know, a code blue is what uh, gets called in a hospital if a patient is found without vital signs. So if there's no pulse or not breathing, uh, first person into the room who finds that will usually pull a a string or kind of a cable and that triggers a code blue the cardiac arrest team comes and tries to resuscitate the patient obviously a um, not something you want to avoid uh, definitely if you're a patient traumatic for the clinicians involved as well and so it's a good goal right that's important to have a good goal and the goal of reducing the number of code blues on a hospital ward is a good goal and the folks who wrote this paper did what um, folks doing QI should do. They started out by trying to understand their system and by understanding the people who work in the system, generating ideas, looking at the data, looking at variation within their system, also looking at variation between their ward and between wards elsewhere. And they started to make some changes. And, and here are some of the changes they made. I won't go through all of these in, in detail, but one of the things they did, this DNA CPR stands for do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So if you, if you wanna reduce the number of code blues, one way to do that is to not uh, attempt CPR. So you know, on the face of it, you might say, well, that's a pretty easy thing to do and, and maybe not the goal. But, but actually, if you're, if you're not doing CPR or not attempting CPR because that's consistent with what the patient's values and preferences uh, dictate, if that's what the patient would want, then that is a good outcome, right? Because uh, doing CPR to somebody who would never want that done is, is harming that patient. So very important. Um, they also uh, started referring more patients to palliative care, uh, also important and often consistent with patients' preferences and values and underutilized patient uh, palliative care. And palliative care clinicians are often better at having those co hard conversations about um, that help clinicians understand what people want and what they don't want near the end of their life. But that's not all they did. Um, they started weekly safety meetings. One of the things that we have learned over the last few decades is that one of the reasons why people die in hospital is because the signs of clinical deterioration aren't recognized. And even if they are recognized, the right treatments aren't quickly instituted. This whole idea of a failure to rescue. So they had a very simple intervention for this, this uh, checklist sticker. So the nurse would call the resident or what in the UK they call a registrar, put a sticker in the chart which outlined a structured assessment. The resident would come up and basically do the assessment according to the sticker. And they did a few other things. They provided data publicly. I think they had the physicians round more often than they used to round. And basically, here, here are their results. You don't need to be a statistician to see that if you look at the uh, code blue calls on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, they had a huge reduction I think about 75% relative risk reduction in the number of code blues. Um, and if this were all, you know, I, actually this would be a good paper even if you stopped right here. It would be a very good paper. But what really, really makes this, I think, 
uh, not just a good quality improvement initiative, but a great quality improvement initiative is this next slide, which actually looks at death. And the reduction isn't as large. I think it's about a 20 or 25% relative risk reduction, but it is statistically significant uh, and it is meaningful. And so this is a reduction in death, not just the code blue. So it's for sure they, some of the reduction came from putting in place those orders not to do CPR, from referring people to palliative care. But it looks like they also uh, started recognizing and treating acutely ill patients earlier. And the number needed to treat to prevent death, 66, which I would argue is a very, very low number needed to treat for an intervention that really lasts just a few days, right? This is just during their hospital stay. And also mentioned in the paper is this basically cost nothing. So, you know, in the world of HTA, we are often looking at very expensive interventions. And in fact, the, some of you will have heard of rapid response teams. Those have been uh, subjected to the techniques of health technology assessment. And, and they, you know, it's widely believed that they work too. The evidence is pretty good that they reduce mortality, reduce code blues, but they are an expensive intervention. And so it's just interesting to think about HTA and QI, two different approaches potentially with the, with the same goal. Um, this is a, a brand new book, uh, How to Implement Evidence-Based Healthcare by Trish Greenhalgh. If you, if you um, look at the inside cover, it actually says that it was published in 2018, which gave me a little bit of a double take when I ordered it from Amazon, arrived in the mail, and then you see it published in 2018. So um, I guess Trish is maybe hoping that it will be viewed as a new book for a while, and hopefully that's true, because hopefully it will be read widely and maybe, maybe reading it will give you a glimpse into, into what the future will look like. And you know, I'm sure some folks in the room and online uh, know Trish's work. She, she actually wrote a book that some of you have probably read called How to Read a Paper, which uh, I think I read when I was a medical student. Really good book in terms of helping people understand what are the key issues when you're looking at a research paper. And in a way, this is sort of a, a companion piece or a companion book. And I think not very many people have really thought as deeply or written as, as widely and intelligently about how to implement evidence-based healthcare. And I will, I will read you the chapter titles because I think, you know, they give a sense of everything we need to think about or almost everything we need to think about as we think about how health technology assessment and quality improvement work together. So the, the first chapter in the book is called Evidence which is good, given your tagline, given the work we do at Health Quality Ontario, we believe in evidence. That's the first chapter. But, but it is only the first chapter. The chapter titles after that are people, groups and teams, organizations, citizens, patients, interestingly, one chapter on citizens, another chapter on patients, uh, technology, and, and actually by technology in this chapter, Trish is mostly, not entirely, but mostly talking about information technology, uh, policy, networks, and systems. So certainly not simple, uh, but all of these things, you know, arguably are part of what we should be thinking about when we think about quality improvement or implementation of, of health technology assessment. And I want to read a quote from Trisha's introduction because I think she, she makes clear how this isn't simple. She says, let me break this news to you gently. Uh, there is no tooth fairy. Uh, implementing research evidence is not just a matter of following procedural steps. What we need to do, Trish argues, is, quote, make contextual judgments about what's likely to work in this situation for these people in this organization with these constraints. So if I take you back to that quality improvement initiative that I talked about in Scotland, that's exactly what those clinicians and uh, you know did. They they thought about what would work for them in their hospital with the constraints that they were working within, which included not enough money for a rapid response team, uh, and given the people on their team. And I think you know I think Trish is right. Like I, I think some of us, and I would put myself in this category, often wish that it was easier or feel that it should be easier uh, to just move evidence into practice, but, but I think it's not. Um, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a little bit of time now talking about what we do at Health Quality Ontario, where uh, basically our, our mandate is to try to help people in the province implement evidence-based health care. And our goal, which is reflected in the name of the legislation that uh, established our agency, is our goal is excellent care for all. And so, so we try to do this in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, first, uh, we make evidence-based recommendations. So we make evidence-based recommendations about how uh, or about what healthcare services should be publicly funded what medical devices. We, we don't look at drugs. You guys look at drugs. We don't. Um, but otherwise, we make recommendations about what healthcare services should be publicly funded. That's our what we call our health technology assessment program. We also make recommendations about standards of care. And, you know, for this, for us to move recommendations into care and improve the lives of people living in the province, the funding recommendations and the quality standards should align. And, and many of them do. So here's a list over the last um, uh, you know, year or so. Some of these are still ongoing. Some of them aren't our own recommendations, but on the left you can see funding recommendations and on the right quality standards. It's not an exhaustive list, but you can see. So we made a recommendation that offloading devices should be used, should be publicly funded, I should say, for people with diabetic foot ulcer. We have also uh, got a quality standard for diabetic foot ulcer, which outlines the kind of care that people with diabetic foot ulcer should receive. I said we don't, we don't do look at drugs, and that's true. This is a drug, pentoxifiline. We didn't make a funding recommendation here, but what we did do is make a recommendation to the provincial government in Ontario that they consider adding this drug to the formulary, not, or, or they should ask their committee, the Committee to Evaluate Drugs, to consider looking at this so it could be added to the formulary. Um, and I, I'll talk a little bit more about our quality standards program. This is a, a pretty new program for us, actually a very new program. We've just released our fourth and fifth quality standards. Those two are on hip fracture and heavy menstrual bleeding. And we released three uh, nearly a year ago on depression, schizophrenia, and behavioral, sim behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. And you know, sometimes when we're starting something new, it's useful to think about the why question, right? Like, why are we doing this? What is the problem we're trying to solve? And when we did that for our quality standards program, this is sort of the, what we came up with as the simple answers to the why question. So probably most important is on the top left, to help patients and residents, if you're living in a long-term care home, families, caregivers, know what to ask for in their care. So, you know, help people understand what is high quality care and, and what could they do to ask for that. Also, health clinicians and healthcare organizations understand what's high quality care and what they could do to improve it. And with the goal that I already mentioned about excellent care for everyone in the province. So I'll walk, I'll walk, uh, I'll walk through one of our quality standards. So this is the quality standard on hip fracture. So you can see each of the parts and and, and we can talk about quality improvement a little bit. So for each quality standard, we have a bunch of, of different, what we call products. First is the clinical guide. Um, so this is quite concise, no more than 15 statements about what kind of care a patient should expect based on the best evidence or on an advisory committee's consensus. And so, you know, this, this is, it, there is a PDF and you can download the PDF, but this is all also available online, smartphone friendly, uh, increasingly being embedded at the point of care and things like digital order sets or even paper order sets, but hopefully increasingly uh, computerized order sets. And so, you know, the statements are simple. So this one says patients with suspected hip fracture are diagnosed within an hour of arriving at hospital. Um, there, this one, and, and this one is, you could actually may not be able to read in the small print, this one is based on an advisory committee consensus. So there will never be high quality evidence to say whether that diagnosis should occur within an hour or within 30 minutes or within two hours. So sometimes we do need people to just come around the table and agree what is a reasonable uh, expectation. We, we provide indicator definitions that clinicians, organizations can use to monitor the quality of their own care. There's no compulsion to monitor the data, but the idea is that if you're going to monitor the data, you might find it helpful to use a definition that we've provided so you can standardize your data collection against someone else's standardized data collection. 
There's a patient guide for each quality standard that basically says exactly the same thing in non-technical language. So, you know, if someone in the room has, uh, you know, is unfortunate enough to have a family member have a hip fracture, you can print this out, you can take it into the hospital, you can see what you think you should be getting or your family member should be getting and, 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 how, and use it to, to facilitate those discussions. We also provide uh, an information and data brief and, and often an infographic to help make the case. So, for example, if you, uh, you know, I would draw your attention to this uh, slide or this part of the slide. So th what this says is that um, if you look at all of the hospitals in Ontario that take care of a lot of people who have hip fracture, I think the threshold here is 100 or more hip fractures a year, the 90-day mortality rate varies from 5% at the low end to 23% at the high end. And that's, that's a huge variation, right? So we, we know that if we could drive evidence into practice, we could probably bring a lot of the hospitals that are up here down at least to the median and hopefully closer to 5%. And that, that would save a lot of lives. We, we know that guidelines are not enough. Like clinical practice guidelines are not enough. Funding recommendations are not enough. So we also for each quality standard put out a set of what we call recommendations for adoption and so these are recommendations to not to clinicians and not to patients but to uh, agencies organizations hospitals government local health and what we call local health integration networks in ontario regional health authorities and other provinces about what could be done to make it easier for clinicians to provide the kind of care that is outlined in the standard. So I'll give you two examples. So we've made a recommendation in this set to ourselves uh, that we should be providing this kind of data, not just on the outcome of, of mortality, but also on some of the process indicators, like whether somebody's having surgery within 48 hours. We, as Health Quality Ontario, should be providing this data back to hospitals. We've also made recommendations to, I'll give you another example, we made a recommendation to the LINs, the local health integration networks, that they should work with hospitals in their region to develop transfer, uh, transfer protocols. Some hospitals have orthopedic surgery departments, some hospitals don't. If you arrive at a hospital that doesn't have an orthopedic surgery department, you need to be transferred quickly to a hospital that does so you can get surgery in a timely way. You know, that can in theory be done on a patient by patient basis, but it'll obviously be more efficient and it'll happen more often if there's a agreed upon transfer protocol in place so the patient can be moved to the hospital with the orthopedic uh, surgeons quickly without sort of having to talk to anyone on an individual basis. Um, you know, I, so the, the ultimate goal is really to, to link all this together. So we link our funding recommendations to our quality standards, our quality standards to the work we're doing uh, to support quality improvement. So I talked about the recommendations for adoption, but I want to talk a little bit more about some of the other stuff we do in our organization. Um, most of this is led by my colleague Lee Fairclough and her team in our quality improvement branch. Some of it's led by my colleague Anna Greenberg uh, and her team in what we call our uh, system performance branch. So, you know, we, we know from evidence that actually providing data to clinicians improves the quality of care. So we're increasingly making that data available to clinicians. Any family doctor in the province can now go onto our website and register to receive a report about the quality of their own care. And I think more than 1,000 already have. This report gives them data about the kind of patients they see, how their practice compares with that of their peers. And it might give them some insights or help them see what areas they should focus their quality improvement efforts on. Um, the Excellent Care for All Act established our agency. One of the other things it did was uh, create a requirement for hospitals uh, and some other healthcare organizations to develop a quality improvement plan and submit that to us. So that's a big uh, program for us, or a really important program for us, is laying out that guidance for hospitals, that guidance for family health teams, for long-term care homes, for home and community care organizations, as to what they should think about when they create their quality improvement plan. And then part of our responsibility is to look at those quality improvement plans and, uh, and support healthcare organizations in putting that into practice. 
We, we also do a whole bunch of other stuff on the quality improvement side to make sure that recommendations and evidence is moving into practice. We support quality improvement collaboratives, like the uh, Ontario Surgical Quality Improvement Network. We help build capacity. So in collaboration with the University of Toronto and the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, we uh, together we've now trained more than 2,000 healthcare professionals in the province to think about quality improvement in a consistent way to use a common language about quality improvement. We, we work with academics to spread and scale interventions that, are, uh, that have been shown to work. So just, uh, I think this week or last week, probably earlier this week, uh, we teamed up with the um, uh, Center for Addiction and Mental Health and some researchers at Open Lab at the University Health Network to uh, announce a spread and scale initiative on patient-oriented discharge summaries. So we know this improves the experience that patients have when they're leaving hospital. And so this will allow that team to uh, have some resources to spread and scale this across several dozen sites in the province. And finally, in this, uh, so this is also important, and this is the work that uh, my colleague Anna Greenberg and her team lead, which is to monitor and report on the quality of care in the province uh, and uh, and regionally, and, and what we hope we're what we hope to achieve by this is that you know data leads to action at the clinician level, but it also leads to action at the regional level or at the provincial level. So we hope these reports help shape policy. We hope these reports help shape how how resources are allocated. And and I want to make super clear that we do this in partnership like we, we I, you know Brian and I and others at Cadiz and HQO have talked a lot about how in the health technology assessment world we just don't have the resources to do what we would like to do uh, individually or even together and so you know we can achieve way more in partnership than we can alone that's true in the health technology assessment space. It's certainly true in the quality improvement space too. So we, we do a lot of our work in partnership with various organizations, healthcare provider organizations, the, the LINs, other government agencies, and, and most importantly with, with individual clinicians and individual patients. So every committee we put together has practicing clinicians and, and patients on it. Um, and I, want, I hope we have a good discussion, but I wanna end with a quote from Don Berwick. Um, one of the sort of, you know, fathers of the whole quality improvement uh, movement, if you will. And so the quote reads, not all change is improvement, but all improvement is change. And I, I like this quote a lot. Uh, and, and I think the main reason I do is that the first part reminds me that, uh, you know, not everything that gets labeled as quality improvement actually makes things uh, better. Right? So some changes, some quality improvement initiatives aren't rooted in evidence. Uh, some treatments aren't rooted in evidence. And if we make changes that aren't evidence-based, aren't evidence-driven, we, we can make things worse. Uh, and, and some change that we don't know whether it works or not should really be done in a research framework where we can get the evidence to then know whether something should be driven in practice. And the second part of this quote reminds me that a lot of the stuff that, that we do, Health Quality Ontario, and arguably that you might do too at Cadith, uh, research, health technology assessment reports, policy papers, et cetera, none of that makes any difference to patients unless it actually leads to change. And so, you know, I think whenever we're doing our work, we should be thinking also about how will this lead to change? And, and I would argue that our job is to think about how health technology assessment and quality improvement together can go hand in hand to make the changes that, that lead to better health care for, for the people we serve. So thanks very much for listening to me and uh, hope we have a good uh, discussion. Thanks. Oh, Peter. Uh, thanks very much. You know, it's, it's kind of been a tradition when Brian O'Rourke is in the room that he asked the first question. So I'm very pleased that he's, we're able to maintain that tradition, oh, okay. even though he's in Toronto. So the question from Brian is, a chicken and egg analogy comes to mind with respect to HGA and quality improvement. What comes first? In your Ontario experience, does HGA drive quality improvement, or do quality improvement initiatives generate topics for HGA? How do we bring the two communities together? That's a great question, and I, I think, you know, in some ways, Brian sort of answered the question. It is bi-directional, and I think it should be bi-directional. Um, even if I go back to this slide, if 
if I can get there, where I show how our funding recommendations and quality standards have linked together. I actually spent, you know, I started the slide with an arrow from funding recommendations to quality standards. But as I was sort of populating the slide, I realized that some of the topics where we've done a health technology assessment and have made a funding recommendation or where it's underway have come the other way. So then I started with some arrows going this way and some arrows going that way. And then I thought that's way too much information. So I tried to figure out how to get the double-sided arrow. It took longer than I thought, but eventually I got there. <laughs> so the bottom line is I think it does go both ways. So for example, we had a... Uh, you know, I may, venous leg ulcer for sure, I know this. So the group de developing the quality standard, the group of clinicians around the table said, you know, there's very good quality evidence that pentoxifiline should be used for patients with venous leg ulcer. Um, but the current uh, guidance that the uh, Ontario, in the Ontario drug plan is that pentoxifiline should only be used for patients with peripheral arterial disease. So that's a case where it clearly went from the quality standard to the recommendation. Um, you know, offloading devices is, is, is an example the other way around. So groups like Wounds Canada and the Registered Nurses Association in Ontario had been advocating to government to fund offloading devices for several years. Um, and, and so eventually we uh, took that on as a health technology assessment, reviewed the evidence, did an economic evaluation for the sort of you know, health economists in the room. This is a dominant technology. So it's, it's probably better and saves the system, or it is better and it probably saves the system money. And, but we know that simply making the funding recommendation won't uh, all of a sudden reduce the amputation rate in the province. Mm -hmm. And so that one has probably gone more the other way, left to right, where we started the health technology assessment, then we started the quality standard, and now we're working with the province, with the LINs, uh, to put that quality standard into practice. I guess I don't, I, so I guess Peter will give questions that are coming online and folks in the room can put up their hand and I'm happy to take them. Yeah, in the back. Thank you very much, that was very good. Uh, I'm Gord Wallace, I uh, formerly work with the CMP, I now work with a CMPA company called the Sages Safety Institute. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges in patient safety in the last decade is that I think we've recognized its importance where the vul many of the vulnerabilities are but there is a general pessimism that we haven't made much impact um, mm. overall. And so I wondered if you'd comment on that and uh, um, any insights on why that might be, or is it true? And if so, what do we do about it? That's a great question. I, I, you know, I am an optimist by nature, and I think that at least in Canada, the data support optimism. So if you, I know the data in Ontario better than I do across the country, but in Ontario for sure are, uh, if you look at, for example, at just mortality rates due to uh, what we might call ambulatory care sensitive conditions or diseases that we know we can treat, mortality rates have been dropping consistently for at least 15 or 20 years and they continue to drop. Uh, so I do think the quality of care is getting better. Um, you know, somebody who still gets to practice a bit in the hospital, even anecdotally, it feels to me that the quality of care is getting better. The way we staff the ward is better than it used to be. The kinds of treatments we can offer, in part due to health technology assessment and, of course, the important work that precedes health technology assessment in terms of research and development. Uh, you know, things like, I don't know why, I think, I'm uh, thinking about Harindra, but tra things like transcatheter aortic valve implantation comes to mind. Um, so I, I am not uh, pessimistic at all. I, sometimes I, you know, get on Twitter and see what Donald Trump is tweeting, and I, I feel a little bit pessimistic about what's going on not too far away, and not just about Trump, but even about the healthcare system in the United States and the rollbacks. And, you know, if, I saw an article recently that, and this, is, this really shocks me, that maternal mortality is actually increasing in the United States, but it's not increasing in Canada. Um, and so I, I am optimistic in our own, at least in our own province, and I think in our own country. Yeah. Hi, um, Jerry Jeff, I'm with Lisa Um Just want to ask you, you talk about 
quote these uh, quality standards uh, clinician groups that you've put mm -hmm. together. I gather that's being that's being done within the confines of uh, your organization, but there are a whole bunch of clinical guidelines that are being mm -hmm. created by medical specialty groups, by right. multidisciplinary groups, uh, clinician groups. I'm just trying to figure out what the interaction between the things that you're Sort of implementing on your own and what's going on yeah. in the here. It's a great question. So uh, I decided in the interest of time to gloss over the methods that we use to develop the quality standards. Uh, for folks who are really into the methods, it's all on our website, the, the methods and the process. And by process, I mean the, the steps we take to uh, put together, for example, the Quality Standard Advisory Committee. We, we don't want, you know, to have the quality standards established by, you know, folks on University Avenue, for example, right? So we put, to, we have open calls for nominations. We look for clinicians and patients from around the province who bring diverse perspectives to the table. Uh, one thing to be to make clear is we we don't make clinical practice guidelines. So a we don't have the resources to do that. Uh, B, we don't, we don't really see that as our mandate. As you mentioned, there are lots of groups developing clinical practice guidelines. What we do do is appraise the clinical practice guidelines and use them where they exist as the foundation for the quality standards. So I can't tell you which uh, clinical practice guideline we relied on most to develop this particular quality standard, but there undoubtedly was one. And you know, part of the challenge with, um, there are a lot of challenges with clinical practice guidelines. Um, probably too many to enumerate here, but I will just say that we feel uh, quite strongly that the idea of a provincial organization coming together with clinicians and patients to articulate clearly what patients should expect from the healthcare system and also what isn't necessarily an expectation is, is a good way forward. Peter? Thanks. This question is from a uh, J initial Murray. It is, how will the time of six to 12 months or longer evolve so that findings remain relevant with the development of new technologies, new durations, new developments and devices? Hmm. So I guess uh, this is probably alluding to the remark I made uh, when I flashed up the definition of health technology assessment. Uh, I guess I can't clarify the question because there's no two-way here. But I'm going to assume this is alluding to the, the remark I made when I flashed up the definition of health technology assessment and said one of the challenges with health technology assessment is timeliness. And I said, you know, sometimes people need an answer today and it takes us several months to do a health technology assessment. And, and I would say I, I don't know. Like I think we are, at Health Quality Ontario, we work pretty hard to... Uh, Ref we are working pretty hard to refine our process so that we can do this as efficiently as possible, but there's a trade-off, and if we do the work too quickly, then there's a chance that w our health technology assessment won't provide the information that leads to the right decision. So I'm not totally sure. I mean, sometimes I think we have to work, we have to communicate what we can deliver and what we can't deliver a little bit more clearly and then work with decision makers so that sometimes they uh, have an interim decision that precedes a final decision is, is one way forward. I saw a question, yep. Robin Lim with the Health Products and Food Hi. Branch of Health Canada. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you very much, it was a wonderful talk. Um, I'm currently wrestling upstream on quality improvement issues on the evidence itself and um, I know you don't do with drugs, but I'm, I'm very interested to find out in your sector, given the, the, the table of contents that you mentioned, the evidence and then the people, so much of quality improvement is, is about the people and getting what totally, has to happen totally agree. and changing that mindset. And I'd be interested to know in your area what your understanding has been about how long it's taken to get mm. people in that headspace to actually think about in an explicit way called quality improvement and what they're doing. That's a great question. You know, again, I guess my answer is pretty optimistic, which is that it doesn't take very long. So I, I think clinicians want to do the right thing, right? You know, that's why people go into medical school or nursing school or wherever. So if you start from that presumption, then it's really just about supporting people so that they can 
provide the highest quality care. And if you start there, I don't think it takes very long. If you start with uh, sticks, uh, sort of rigid accountability mechanisms, bonuses, and um, uh, penalties, financial penalties, then I think it takes a really long time. I don't know if I have hard evidence to back up that claim. Maybe it's just my own optimism, but I think, you know, it, it's, fulfill, it's fulfilling to provide high quality care, right? So why would people not want to do that? That's really helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Peter? Uh, thanks. And, uh, given the time, this may have to be the last question unless we can squeeze in one quick one. Uh, this comes from Alberta Health Services. Thanks, Irfan. Great presentation. Can you talk about how knowledge translation, quality improvement, and HTA connect together? In my mind, all three need to be connected to ensure implementation and improvement in healthcare. What are your thoughts of adding KT to the sum of the parts? I, you know, it's a great question. And I confess, so I wondered whether someone would ask this sort of a question. And I confess a little bit of ambivalence myself with the title of this talk, because I, I don't love jargon. And you know, uh, like it probably goes without saying, but just to be explicit, like when, when you know, as a clinician, if you're speaking with a patient, you, you never use phrases like quality improvement or health technology assessment or knowledge translation. And part of that joke about James Lind was, you know, to maybe make people think about that a little bit. And Trish actually in this book covers this in detail. So to whoever asked that question, I would say it's worth reading what Trish has to say about this. And if I could summarize based on my memory a little bit, I think what she would say is something like, you know, it's more important what these terms mean. And most of them are probably a little bit of an oversimplification about what needs to happen in practice. And so to me, it's not about the terms. It's just about thinking about how do we, and that probably how, why she titled her book what she titled, right? How to Implement Evidence-Based Healthcare. So her title is not how HTA and QI should work together, but how to implement evidence-based healthcare, which arguably itself is a little bit jargonish, but maybe less jargonish than, than the title of my talk. But <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Peter. You want the slides at the end, right? Uh, thank you, everyone.